When Florida Dr. Thomas Newman died of COVID-19, he left his family with a large collection of sports cards worth some $20 million. One is a Babe Ruth card that could set a new world record. Sports cards were made in the U.S. in the 19th and 20th centuries. They were included in packages of gum, and children collected them. While cards are still made now, it is the old ones that are worth a lot of money. Newman started his collection about 40 years ago. His family says he was driven by the love of collecting, not money. He built his collection traveling around the United States at conventions and kept his cards in a locked container at his Tampa home. Nancy Newman was his wife. He loved his paper babies, she said. He got such joy out of it. Newman died in January at age 73. He kept the collection of more than 1,000 old and modern baseball, football, and hockey trading cards mostly private outside of his close family and friends. It will be shared at an online auction at California-based auction house Memory Lane from June 21st to July 10th. Stuart Newman is his son. It is cool for his legacy that he put 40 years into collecting, and he is getting the recognition that was probably overdue, he said. The most valuable card in the collection is a 1933 Babe Ruth card. Babe Ruth was a star baseball player for the New York Yankees during the 1920s and 1930s. He is widely considered to be the best player in history. Experts say the card could break the $5.2 million world record price for any single sports card. The Babe Ruth card is rated Mint 9. Cards are rated on a 1 to 10 scale, so a 9 is almost perfect. It is the only Babe Ruth card of its kind that is known to exist, and it comes to auction at a time when prices for sports trading cards have gone way up. Newman's son said he bought the Babe Ruth card around 15 or 20 years ago for far less than its current worth. He refused several requests to sell it. Other valuable cards in Newman's collection include a 1916 Babe Ruth rookie card and a near-perfect 1952 Mickey Mantle rookie card that could sell for $1 million. Mickey Mantle played for the Yankees in the 1950s and 1960s. A rookie card is a player's first card created when he becomes a professional and is often considered valuable. J.P. Cohen is the president of Memory Lane Auctions. He said, There are some amazing one-of-a-kind pieces that we, as a company who have been doing this over twenty years, have never seen before. Newman began collecting as a boy but his mother threw out his cards when he left for college. He started collecting again in the 1980s, visiting card collector conventions around the country, often with his son. I remember it was hard getting my dad away so I could even just have some lunch or something, said Stuart Newman. Thomas Newman and his family had a general idea about the value of his collection, but card prices have greatly increased over the past few years and especially during the pandemic. He would want it to be an investment for the family's future, Nancy Newman said. I am sure he is looking down 
and is very happy with what's happening with the collection. Scientists say that for the first time, a new genetic treatment has helped a blind patient partly regain his sight. The treatment is a form of optogenetics, a method that genetically changes cells to make them produce light-sensitive proteins. While the method had long been used in studies of the brain, research related to treating blind patients had not been done. In the new experiments, a blind patient was able to use special eyeglasses to identify and count different objects sitting on a table. A team of researchers from the United States and Europe recently reported the findings in a study appearing in Nature Medicine. One of the patients in the study was a 58-year-old man who has suffered with retinitis pigmentosa for 40 years. The progressive eye disease destroys light-sensing cells in the eye's retina and can lead to total blindness. These light-sensing cells, called photoreceptors, communicate visual information to the brain through the optic nerve. But when these cells progressively fail, blindness sets in. The experiments used genetic methods to add a light-sensing protein to the retina's cells. The kind of protein used, called crimson R, can be found in algae, the researchers said. The protein reacts to light by changing its shape and permitting the flow of ions into cells. The patient's worst seeing eye was injected with a vector or carrier that contained genetic instructions for the crimson R protein. The protein is only sensitive to amber-colored light, which the researchers said they used because it is safer than blue-colored light and causes less strain on the eye. For the experiment, the team built a special set of glasses or goggles that contained a camera to capture and project visual images onto the retina at amber light wavelengths. The patient began training with the goggles about five months after the injection to give the protein enough time to settle in the cells. After learning to use the goggles, the patient was able to recognize, count, find and touch different objects sitting on a table in front of him. In addition, the patient also reported improvements in his ability to identify other objects during his day-to-day -day activities in both indoor and outdoor environments, the researchers said. I hope it will be a breakthrough said lead study writer Jose Alain Sahel about the method. He is chair of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh, the director of the UPMCI Center, and a professor at Sorbonne University in France. Sahel said the experiments provided the first evidence that it is possible to use optogenetics to help blind humans regain their sight. For now, blind patients with photoreceptor disease and an operating optive nerve would be the best candidates for the treatment. But, Sahel said, 
it will take time before the treatment can be widely offered to patients. The team says it hopes to start new experiments with larger numbers of people in Paris, Pittsburgh, and London as soon as COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. Today we are going to talk about coins. Coins are small, flat, and usually round pieces of metal issued by a government. As money, in the United States, we have coins for dollars, half dollars, quarters, dimes, five cents or nickels, and one cent or a penny. There are two sides to a coin. For example, the U.S. quarter has an image of George Washington on one side. And an eagle on the other side. So naturally, we call the Washington side head, and the other side tail. And that brings us to our first expression: two sides of the same coin. If two things are two sides of the same coin, they are closely related, even though they seem different. For example, experts often consider mental health issues and homelessness to be two sides of the same coin. In other words, there is often a connection or relationship between the two. Now we use coins to buy things. We also use coins to decide between two choices. We flip or toss a coin, and call heads or tails. Heads, you win, or tails, I win. Whosoever call matches the side of the coin showing is the winner. This is what we mean by winning a decision by a flip of a coin, or a coin toss. In many sports, deciding who gets the ball first or takes the field first is sometimes done by a coin toss. There is a certain amount of luck involved in a flip of a coin. You have a fifty-fifty chance of winning. For some things, those odds may not be good enough. When the stakes are very high, meaning when you could lose a lot, you might not want to flip a coin. For example, it would not be a good idea to bet double or nothing of your entire life's savings by flipping a coin. There is a fifty-fifty chance of your losing everything. If the two choices are both good and nearly equal, a coin toss might be the perfect way to come to a decision. Let's say you and your best friend want to go out for dinner. She wants Italian, you want Korean. You both like the two restaurants, so a coin toss is a perfect way to decide. We also use this expression to describe a situation where two outcomes, usually opposite, are likely to happen, and they will be decided by chance, not by reason or scientific research. To some degree, the results are out of your hands. Here's an example. It's out of your hands whether the rain will come today. I could also say it's a coin toss whether the rain will come today. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Whether or not we will be back next week will not be decided by a flip of the coin. We will definitely have a new program for you. On that, you can bet your bottom dollar.
some young black people want their universities to fulfill their promises to help the descendants of enslaved people. They say students and people who live in college communities need to hold the universities responsible. And they say this is the time to do it. Jason Carroll recently graduated from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Shepard Thomas graduated from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. a year ago. They are descendants of enslaved people. Carroll said, There's been a shift in America. We're at a different place. Just a few years ago, it was controversial to say Black Lives Matter. Carol and Thomas say at least their universities recently identified their ties to the slave trade, but they believe there is still more to be done. Thomas is a member of a group of students who came to Georgetown because of a special program for the descendants of enslaved people. In the 1800s, Georgetown's leaders helped sell a group of 272 men, women, and children who were slaves at large farms in Maryland to other farms in Louisiana. The money from the sale helped the school pay off debt. About five years ago, Georgetown said it would give students like Thomas special admissions considerations. He is among the first of that group to graduate. Some of the older universities in the U.S. had ties to slavery or received money from people who sold slaves. Craig Stephen Wilder at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology wrote a book about the connection between higher education and slavery in 2013. Around the time of Georgetown's announcement, he said, every college that was established before the American Revolution has direct ties to slavery. Carroll was a student government leader during his time at Brown. Students there recently voted to ask the university to offer a program similar to the one offered by Georgetown. It would help the descendants of slaves entangled with and or afflicted by the university and the Brown family. In addition to Georgetown and Brown, people are watching the University of Chicago, the University of Virginia, and the University of Georgia. The city of Athens is home to the University of Georgia. The city is trying to make up for a 1960s plan that took over the properties of 50 black families in order to build student housing. Activists and students say both the university and the city need to pay attention to the way the construction hurt families. Hattie Whitehead Thomas is now 72. She grew up in the Athens neighborhood taken over by the school. She said, The school needs to do more and acknowledge what it did. The school has said that the student housing helped black people because students from all racial and socioeconomic backgrounds lived there. Earlier in 2021, the mayor of Athens signed a resolution that said the city would take steps to make up for the harm caused when the land was taken over. The University of Virginia, or UVA, in the town of Charlottesville, was established by the third American president, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was a slave owner. Lawmakers in Virginia recently approved a program. It requires the state's five public colleges, including UVA, to identify the descendants of enslaved people who worked on the land that the schools now occupy, and offer them benefits. One of the benefits might be free college. Colleen Yates says she is a descendant of one of Jefferson's slaves. She said the university needs to stand up 
and honor our ancestors. Brian Coy is a UVA spokesperson. He said the school is not yet sure what kind of offer it will make to the descendants of slaves. But he said UVA created a memorial that recognizes the work enslaved people did for the school. Kane Jordan is a graduate student at the University of Chicago. He said students there are upset that the university does not seem to be willing to take full responsibility for how it dealt with Black people in the past. The school removed markers honoring Stephen Douglas, a U.S. senator from the 1800s who profited from slave labor. But the school said Douglas has no connection with the university, which was founded after the senator's death. The University of Chicago president is expected to make a statement noting the school's commitment to racial fairness. All of it rings hollow if you're founded on black pain and you're not willing to acknowledge that, Jordan said. Thomas and Carol want people to continue to follow the stories at Georgetown and Brown Universities. Both schools say they will look for ways to spend money on community projects that would help slave descendants. Thomas said observers need to pay attention to how the money is spent. The fear is that the university will use these funds for their own purposes. In Rhode Island, one part of the Brown University plan is to spend money to help local schools in Providence. However, Carol notes that most local students are not black. That's not really a solution, he said. In a way, it's even more insulting. Devarian Baldwin is an American Studies professor at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He said, The students and community members should keep the pressure on the universities. They will do as little as they can get away with, he said. The United States government is facing new pressure to solve a mystery. Are American diplomats and officials being attacked with microwaves or radio waves? The attack has been called the Havana Syndrome because the first cases affected officials in 2016 at the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. People who are believed to be affected have reported pain in the head, losing balance, and signs related to concussions. Some have needed months of medical treatment. Others have reported hearing a loud noise before experiencing the syndrome. A U.S. defense official said there are at least 130 cases across the government now under an investigation. The National Security Council is leading the investigation. Especially worrying are the discoveries of at least two possible incidents around Washington, D.C. One happened near the White House last November. As the number of cases grows, U.S. lawmakers and the people who may have been affected want answers. But scientists and government officials do not know who might be responsible, or even if the incidents were actually attacks. An official review by the U.S. government could have far-reaching impacts. If a U.S. enemy has been carrying out damaging attacks against U.S. officials, there would be calls for a serious countermeasure. For now, the Biden administration says it takes the problem seriously and is making sure those affected have good medical care. A bill introduced in both houses of Congress recently would raise payments for injuries suffered in the incidents. Mark Zaid is a lawyer representing several people who have experienced the syndromes. He and other critics say the U.S. government has not taken the problem seriously or provided those impacted with necessary medical support. Zaid received National Security Agency documents with information about attacks 
dating to the 1990s. The documents note an unknown hostile country possibly having a microwave weapon to weaken, intimidate, or kill an enemy over time. The government has a much better understanding of it than it has let on, Zaid said. William Burns is the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. He told Congress that he would make sure the investigation gets to the bottom of what caused these incidents and who was responsible. So far, U.S. officials have not identified a possible country. A study looking at causes of the attacks was published last December by the National Academy of Sciences. The study identifies directed pulsed radio frequency energy as the most probable cause. It says a radio frequency attack could change brain activity without causing severe structural damage. But the study could not make a certain judgment on how U.S. officials may have been hit. James Giordano is a neurology professor at Georgetown University. He has worked with the State Department on investigating the Havana cases. Giordano said, There is evidence of brain injuries in several people, suggesting they may have been affected by radio waves. He identified two possible sources. One is a device used to directly target people. Another is a tool that used energy waves for intelligence gathering. That tool may have accidentally harmed the targeted people. Giordano said the attack outside the White House was very similar to the Havana cases. Other scientists disagree with the findings. Robert Balo is a doctor from the University of California, Los Angeles. He argued that any possible weapon would be too large or require too much power to be used secretly. Balo said the growing number of cases considered energy attacks is actually linked to mass psychogenic illness. A psychogenic illness is when people learn of others in their group with an illness and begin to feel sick themselves. Many people are hearing about it, and that's how it gets spread, Balo said. Mark Polymeropoulos is a former CIA officer who suffered a brain injury in Russia in 2017. He believes the U.S. will find the cause of the incidents and who is responsible. If the U.S. finds a country responsible, Polymeropoulos said, there's going to be uncomfortable decisions on what to do. Standardized tests are tests that aim to measure a student's progress in a subject. The tests are returning to America's schools this spring after the year-long pandemic. But millions of students will face shorter exams that carry less importance. And most families are being given the choice to not do testing at all. With new guidelines from the Biden administration, states are using different testing plans. These plans aim to reduce the stress of tests while still getting some data on student learning. However, large numbers of students will go untested, meaning it will be unclear how much learning has been set back by the pandemic. Robin Lake is director of the Center on Reinventing Public Education at the University of Washington. We will end up with a highly imperfect set of data, Lake said. Lake added that the U.S. will have to follow and learn about the issue for at least the next few years and maybe the next decade. The current debate is the latest in a series of battles over school testing among American parents and education leaders. As in the past, parents are divided. Some are demanding tests to get an idea of their children's progress. Others see no need to put their children through the stress of a test. 
As a teacher, Jay Wamstead believes there is value in testing. But when his sixth grade daughter Kira asked to not be tested this year, he saw no reason to object. He already knows she needs to catch up on math after months of online learning. And as a teacher at her school, he knew that many other students were not taking the tests either. I know she's a little behind, and I don't need that data. Said Wamstead. Parent Abby Norman found her third-grade daughter crying in her bedroom the morning tests were set to begin at her school near Atlanta, Georgia. Priscilla, nine, had just returned to the classroom after learning from home. She was worried that she was not prepared, but she did well on the test. She was so nervous about this test that I don't care about at all. That does not matter to me," said Norman. Those who oppose testing say it is the last thing students need after such a difficult year. Schools have other ways to study students' progress, they say, and testing only takes away from classroom time. Testing supporters say there is still value in collecting as much data as possible. Lake at the University of Washington said even imperfect results can be used to help students recover. In normal years, the federally required tests are used to study a school's performance and its students' progress. In some states, students must pass certain tests to move to the next grade or graduate from high school. But this year, most states are measuring student growth and not making schools and students responsible for the results. After last year's tests were canceled, there was hope that this year's exams would give information. About the pandemic's effect on education, but different testing between states now makes a comparative study impossible," said Scott Marion, the executive director of the nonprofit Center for Assessment. The group helps states design and evaluate tests. Still, he believes the results will have value. As schools begin the long process to help students recover, he said, "This year's data will provide a starting point to measure against." Memorial Day is a national holiday observed in the United States on the last Monday in May. This year, Memorial Day is observed on May 31st. It is the day when Americans honor the women and men. Who have died fighting in America's wars? For most Americans, however, it is the unofficial start of summer. Carol Everhart is president of the Rehoboth Beach Dewey Beach Chamber of Commerce. The organization often refers to the towns in Delaware as the nation's summer capital, since people from Washington D.C. Will likely spend the summer along their beaches. Everhart said, "We expect very, very high visits this summer." She pointed out that some could not wait to start their summer vacation after the year-long pandemic. People, she said, have visited the Delaware coasts as early as January. Shortly after the start of the COVID-19 vaccination program, in 2019, the Delaware beaches had nearly eight million summer visitors. With vaccination and without cloth face coverings or social distancing, Everhart said she expects to have as many as nine million visitors this year. Back in the nation's capital of Washington D.C., 
Memorial Day tradition continues with the observance at Arlington National Cemetery, across the Potomac River. It is the most famous burial place in America. Before the pandemic, more than four million people visited the cemetery every year. The tradition began on May 30th, 1868. When flowers were placed on the graves of Union and Confederate soldiers in the cemetery, it was called Decoration Day back then. Since 1948, on the Thursday before Memorial Day, soldiers from the Third U.S. Infantry, the Old Guard, have placed small American flags in front of every headstone in the cemetery. Lines of simple white headstones mark the soldiers' graves. But the 80-hectare cemetery also serves as a burial place for people of national and historical importance. Two presidents are buried there. William Howard Taft in 1930, and John F. Kennedy in 1963. Other famous people buried at the cemetery include world champion boxer Joe Lewis, North Pole explorer Robert E. Perry, and the seven astronauts who died in the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion. Nearly 4,000 former slaves are also buried at Arlington. One of them is James Parks. He dug the first graves in the cemetery. The best-known memorial in the nation's capital, however, is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which opened in 1982. In 1980, a group of former soldiers announced a competition to design a memorial. The winner was Maya Lin, a 21-year-old student at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Lin designed a memorial formed by two walls of black stone, about 76 meters long. The walls meet to form a V. The names of more than 58,000 Americans killed or declared missing in action are cut into the stone. Almost any time of day, you can see people looking for the name of a family member or friend who died in the war. Once they find the name, many rub a pencil on paper over the letters to copy it. Many people leave remembrances at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. After the success of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Congress approved a memorial to the Korean War veterans, which opened in July of 1995. The Korean War lasted from 1950 to 1953. The memorial honors those who died. It also honors those who survived. The Korean War has been called the last foot soldiers' war. The memorial includes a group of 19 statues of soldiers. People who drive along a road near the memorial sometimes think the statues are real soldiers. The Women in Military Service for America Memorial opened in 1997. The memorial is near the entrance of Arlington National Cemetery. It recognizes the service of all the women 
who have taken part in the nation's wars. About two million women have served or currently serve in the armed forces. One of the lesser-known memorials on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., is often called the Temple. The round stone structure honors people from the District of Columbia who died in World War I. The war was fought from 1914 to 1918. The memorial was completed in 1931. It is the only District of Columbia memorial on the National Mall. Between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument on the National Mall is the World War II Memorial. The United States entered the war after Japan bombed the Navy base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on December 7, 1941. Sixteen million men and women served in the American military between 1941 and 1945. More than 400,000 died. The World War II Memorial is built of bronze and granite. In the center, at ground level, is a round pool of water. Except in very cold weather, water shoots from a circle of fountains in the middle. When the sun is just right, rainbows of color dance in the air. Fifty-six stone pillars rise around the pool. They represent each of the American states and territories, plus the District of Columbia at the time of the war. On two tall arches appear the names of where the fighting took place. One says Atlantic, the other says Pacific. There are not yet memorials for soldiers who died in America's most recent wars, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The soldiers are buried in Section 60 of Arlington Cemetery. The section is often called the saddest place in America. On Memorial Day, Americans will stop for one minute at 3 o'clock local time for the National Moment of Remembrance to honor the soldiers who have died in service to the country no matter what wars they served in. International organizations and other groups are calling for climate change studies to become a usual part of school curriculums around the world. They say such education is an important step toward reaching targets on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The United Nations Education, Science, and Culture Organization, or UNESCO, said this month that environmental studies should be taught in all countries by 2025. This may seem like a large goal, but some environmental groups and politicians say it is not enough. Lorenzo Fioramonti is an Italian lawmaker and a former education minister. He said, without faster progress on education, there will be no chance of reaching the goal of zero carbon emissions by 2050. Fioramonti fought for a law in 2020 that made Italy the world's first country to have all schools teach about climate change. But he admits that forcing all schools to teach it has been difficult. He resigned shortly after the law was passed, so he was unable to oversee its establishment. At the same time, 
The COVID-19 emergency left Italy's schools struggling to teach the usual curriculum. New Zealand has since begun teaching climate change studies for students between 13 and 19 years old. Other countries, such as Argentina and Mexico, are taking steps toward teaching it also. The Brookings Institution, a United States research group, has called for climate action projects in all schools by 2025. The group examined how people buy products after they have studied climate change. It found that investing in education would be more effective in cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 than investing in wind and solar power. Jim Knight is a Labour Party politician in Britain and the former schools minister. He presented a bill last Tuesday calling for sustainable citizenship education. It included climate change studies and would become part of the normal school curriculum starting in 2023. Britain is the current president of the group of seven leading industrial nations, and Italy is leading the G20, a group of 20 major economies. Together, they could play an important part in pushing climate change education. These two groups are organizing the UN Climate Change Conference, known as COP26. It will be held in Glasgow, Scotland in November. Knight said, If we are to make the changes in energy consumption, transport, and food choices, that we need to reach our carbon zero goal, then the best place to start is in schools. Green parties and interest groups have also been pushing the G20 to officially support the proposal requiring that schools teach about climate change. Education ministers from the member countries will meet in the Italian city of Catania on June 22nd. San Francisco closed some major roads to cars during the coronavirus pandemic to provide more space for people to safely exercise and socialize. Now a debate has begun over whether to permanently keep vehicles off some of those roads. Some citizens are pushing to keep cars off some of the city's much-used streets, like the main road into Golden Gate Park. Others support reopening the roads to traffic, saying the step is a necessary part of returning to normal life. San Francisco closed more than 72 kilometers of neighborhood streets. The closures began in April 2020 after Mayor London Breed declared a state of emergency. City officials are now trying to decide which roads might remain closed permanently. Debate over the issue has been marked by demonstrations on both sides that have centered on safety and environmental concerns. Shimon Walton is president of San Francisco's Board of Supervisors. He has argued against the continued closure of John F. Kennedy Drive in Golden Gate Park, a major road. He said closing the street and its free parking spaces will affect low-income families who cannot easily bike or take public transportation to the park. 
San Francisco's Vanessa Gregson loves the fact that JFK Drive, a four-lane road that runs along the beach, is automobile-free. She now rides her bicycle through the area and enjoys the quiet. You hear the beach. You hear the waves. Gregson told the Associated Press. You feel like you're in nature, and you're in San Francisco. But Tim Boyle, who lives near the road, says life has been anything but peaceful since the street was closed to cars. This is because trucks. Motorcycles and other vehicles now move through his neighborhood because of the closures. He said his street used to be very peaceful. Now he finds traffic near his home is very heavy. About 2.4 kilometers of JFK Drive remain closed to vehicles. The road through Golden Gate Park is normally used by more than 24 million visitors a year. Another closed street, the city's Great Highway, usually carries more than 18,000 vehicles a day. San Francisco's streets are set to reopen. 120 days after the mayor lifts an emergency declaration, which could come next month. A city spokeswoman said the board of supervisors will make the final decision about JFK Drive and the Great Highway. They could decide to fully or partly reopen the roads. Or keep them permanently closed to vehicles. Seattle and New York are other U.S. cities looking to permanently ban cars from streets temporarily closed during the pandemic. In Europe, Paris officials announced plans to ban most traffic in the city's center. With exceptions for public transportation, delivery trucks, and residents' vehicles, Connie Chan is the supervisor for an area affected by the closures along the beach and in Golden Gate Park. She told the AP she thinks most people are probably in the middle on the issue. Wanting both open space and clear transportation paths, they just want to be able to go where they need to go, and not be stuck in traffic. Chan said. Honduran immigrant Kelly Mabel Gonzalez Breeb entered the United States legally this month to join her children in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She had not seen them since 2017, when U.S. border officials separated the family, under policy of the former administration of President Donald Trump. Keldy missed celebrating birthdays and holidays together. Her teenagers filled out and grew facial hair. There were times I thought I would never see them again, she said. Keldy fled Honduras with her sons after drug traffickers. Threatened their lives. She asked for asylum at the U.S. border. Instead, U.S. officials separated her from her children, put her in jail, and then sent her back to Honduras. These actions were part of President Trump's policy to arrest all adults entering the country illegally. Her sons were detained temporarily, and then permitted to go to live in Philadelphia with relatives. Keldy's immigration story began on the North Caribbean shore of Honduras, a tourist area. Her husband was a guide, taking visitors on rainforest, wetlands, and river tours. She described herself as a middle-class housewife who prepared meals for the tourists who employed her husband's services. Criminal drug trafficking groups controlled territory in the area. 
They demanded money of businesses and individuals in exchange for protection. The punishment for failing to pay was murder. Assassins killed four of Keldy's brothers and sisters. After she spoke against the killers during a trial in 2011, she received many death threats. There was a price on her head, she was told. The whole family fled to Mexico in 2013, but the Mexican government returned them to Honduras immediately. Back in Honduras, they sought safety and secrecy in a rural mountain area. Her husband left for the U.S. again, this time reaching the state of Texas. Then, in 2017, neighbors warned Keldy that people were asking worrisome questions about her. So she fled the country again with her sons. She crossed the border with her youngest son, Eric, now 17, and her middle child, Mino, now 19, in the fall of 2017. Keldy stopped a Border Patrol car to ask for asylum. The officials took her and her sons together to a detention center in Deming, New Mexico, 35 miles north of the border. They put restraints on her and separated her from the boys. Soon, the officials released the boys and family members paid for their flight to Philadelphia. Their older brother, Alex, now 21, became legally responsible for his brothers and cared for them while they went to school. He worked in the building industry. But Keldy was kept in an Immigration and Customs Enforcement detention center in El Paso, Texas, for a year and a half. Officials sent her to Honduras in January 2019. She returned to Mexico, waiting for a chance to enter the United States. Her family sent her money to live on. She video messaged with her boys. The memories of their graduations and other big moments during that time are painful because she could not be with them. Finally, last month, Linda Corchado, director of legal services at the nonprofit Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center, contacted her. Officials in the Biden administration were working to reunite families separated at the border. She told Keldy to get passport photos. Keldy entered Texas on May 4th in a car with Corchado. Then she flew to Philadelphia. A video shows the family reunion on May 4th in the Philadelphia home of a relative. Keldy cried while her children hugged her. Hola, mi amor, amor mio. Hello, my love, my love, she said, her face buried in the arms of her sons. Keldy is thankful to be with her family, free from death threats in Honduras and the pain of separation. But there are many difficulties. Keldy's son, Mino, left school to pay the rent on the house that six of them share. She wants to get a job, but is caring for her seven-year-old niece who has special needs and her 75-year-old mother. She also cooks and cleans for the family. Keldy says she sees drug use and hears gunshots in their Philadelphia neighborhood. She is happy now to be with her children. She knows that it is more than many of her fellow migrants have. Every day I pray to God for other mothers to be able to come in. They cry for their kids, she said. They ask me, Do you know anything new? And I tell them to have patience. And I tell them they will succeed. Our story today is The Devil and Tom Walker. It was written by Washington Irving. Here is Shep O'Neill with our story. Before we begin our story, let us go back 300 years to the late 1600s. In those years, one of the most famous men in the world was Captain William Kidd. Captain Kidd was a pirate. He sailed the seas, capturing any ships he found. 
He and his men took money from these ships. Captain Kidd hid this money in different places. Captain Kidd was captured by the English in Boston, Massachusetts, and executed in the year 1701. From that time on, people all over the world searched in many places for Captain Kidd's stolen money. The people who lived in Massachusetts in the 1700s believed Captain Kidd buried some of his treasure near Boston. Not far from Boston was a small river which ran into the Atlantic Ocean. An old story said that Captain Kidd had come up this river from the ocean, then he buried his gold and silver and jewels under a big tree. The story said that this treasure was protected by the devil himself, who was a good friend of Captain Kidd. In the year 1727, a man named Tom Walker lived near this place. Tom Walker was not a pleasant man. He loved only one thing, money. There was only one person worse than Tom. That was his wife. She also loved money. These two were so hungry for money that they even stole things from each other. One day, Tom Walker was returning home through a dark forest. He walked slowly and carefully so that he would not fall into a pool of mud. At last, he reached a piece of dry ground. Tom sat down on a tree that had fallen. As he rested, he dug into the earth with a stick. He knew the story that Indians had killed prisoners here as sacrifices to the devil. But this did not trouble him. The only devil Tom was afraid of was his wife. Tom's stick hit something hard. He dug it out of the earth. It was a human skull. In the skull was an Indian axe. Suddenly, Tom Walker heard an angry voice. Don't touch that skull. Tom looked up. He saw a giant sitting on a broken tree. Tom had never seen such a man. He wore the clothes of an Indian. His skin was almost black and covered with ashes. His eyes were big and red. His black hair stood up from his head. He carried a large axe. The giant asked, What are you doing on my land? But Tom Walker was not afraid. He answered, What do you mean? This land belongs to Mr. Peabody. The strange man laughed and pointed to the tall trees. Tom saw that one of the trees had been cut by an axe. He looked more closely and saw that the name Peabody had been cut into the tree. Mr. Peabody was a man who got rich by stealing from Indians. Tom looked at the other trees. Every one had the name of some rich, important man from Massachusetts. Tom looked at the tree on which he was sitting. It also had a name cut into it, the name of Absalom Croninshield. Tom remembered that Mr. Croninshield was a very rich man. People said he got his money, as Captain Kidd did, by stealing ships. Suddenly the giant shouted, 
Cronin Shield is ready to be burned. I'm going to burn many trees this winter. Tom told the man that he had no right to cut Mr. Peabody's trees. The stranger laughed and said, I have every right to cut these trees. This land belonged to me a long time before Englishmen came to Massachusetts. The Indians were here. Then you Englishmen killed the Indians. Now I show Englishmen how to buy and sell slaves, and I teach their women how to be witches. Tom Walker now knew that the giant was the devil himself. But Tom Walker was still not afraid. The giant said Captain Kidd had buried great treasures under the trees, but nobody could have them unless the giant permitted it. He said Tom could have these treasures, but Tom had to agree to give the giant what he demanded. Tom Walker loved money as much as he loved life, but he asked for time to think. Tom went home. He told his wife what had happened. She wanted Captain Kidd's treasure. She urged him to give the devil what he wanted. Tom said no. At last, Mrs. Walker decided to do what Tom refused to do. She put all her silver in a large piece of cloth and went to see the dark giant. Two days passed. She did not return home. She was never seen again. People said later that Tom went to the place where he had met the giant. He saw his wife's cloth hanging in a tree. He was happy because he wanted to get her silver. But when he opened the cloth, there was no silver in it, only a human heart. Tom was sorry he lost the silver, but not sorry he lost his wife. He wanted to thank the giant for this, and so every day he looked for the giant. Tom finally decided that he would give the giant what he wanted in exchange for Captain Kidd's treasure. One night, Tom Walker met the giant and offered his soul in exchange for Captain Kidd's treasure. The devil now wanted more than that. He said that Tom would have to use the treasure to do the devil's work. He wanted Tom to buy a ship and bring slaves to America. As we have said, Tom Walker was a hard man who loved nothing but money. But even he could not agree to buy and sell human beings as slaves. He refused to do this. The devil then said that his second most important work was lending money. The men who did this work for the devil forced poor people who borrowed money to pay back much more than they had received. Tom said he would like this kind of work. So the devil gave him Captain Kidd's treasure. A few days later, Tom Walker was a lender of money in Boston. Everyone who needed help, and there were many who did, came to him. Tom Walker became the richest man in Boston. When people were not able to pay him, he took away their farms, their horses, and their houses. As he got older and richer, Tom began to worry. What would happen 
when he died. He had promised his soul to the devil. Maybe, maybe, he could break that promise. Tom then became very religious. He went to church every week. He thought that if he prayed enough, he could escape from the devil. One day, Tom took the land of a man who had borrowed money. The poor man asked for more time to pay. Please do not destroy me, he said. You have already taken all my money. Tom got angry and started to shout, Let the devil take me if I have taken any money from you. That was the end of Tom Walker. For just then he heard a noise. He opened the door. There was the black giant holding a black horse. The giant said, Tom! I have come for you. He picked up Tom and put him on the horse. Then he hit the horse, which ran off, carrying Tom. Nobody ever saw Tom Walker again. A farmer said that he saw the black horse with a man on it, running wildly, into the forest. After Tom Walker disappeared, the government decided to take Tom's property, but there was nothing to take. All the papers which showed that Tom owned land and houses were burned to ashes. His boxes of gold and silver had nothing in them but small pieces of wood. The wood came from newly cut trees. Tom's horses died, and his house suddenly burned to ashes. <laughs>